welcome everyone. Um, I'm Richard Herman. I'm a professor emeritus at the Ohio State University and I'm co-director of the research group on American foreign and military policy at the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. And I'm very um, thankful for all of you to tune in and we're, we're heading toward 90 participants already. So I know we have a great crowd here because we have really three great speakers. And I'm very uh, pleased that they've agreed to join us. Dr. Yanko Ortel is the director of the Asia program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. <laughs> Dr. Richard Tricani um, is the program director at the Central European Institute of Asian Studies at the Palaki University in the Czech Republic. And Dr. Peter Gries is a Lee Kwai Hong chair and director of the Manchester Institute, a China Institute in, uh, at the University of Manchester. Our plan is to have each of them uh, get us started by making 10 minutes or so of comments. And then after that first half hour, move into a more back and forth conversation. You can participate uh, by using the question and answer function and I will pass your questions on uh, or comments onto the panel. Uh, before I more fully introduce our speakers, let me say a few words about the topic and the issues I've asked each of our three guests to address. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor to the President, in a U.S. Institute for a Peace event on January 29th, I attended, said that uh, the main strategy of the Biden administration would be find, and I quote, positions of strength, a uh, term he uh, attributed to Dean Atchison. And he said the most important uh, of these positions of strength in the strategy the Biden administration would follow would be coordination of policy with Europe and our most powerful European allies. And at the top of the list, Jake put in terms of things he wanted to see Europe and the United States work on were relations with China. He said he thought that was the most single most important strategic issue they would deal with. And while it's obvious that the United States and Europe uh, are closer to each other than they are to China, when it comes to political values and probably about how they think commerce and markets should work, the relationships between European states and China and the relationships between European states and the United States are multidimensional. So two weeks ago, uh, I heard at an Atlantic Council event, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron uh, describe uh, French and European relations with China as both uh, strategic rivals, a term the European uh, Commission has used for a long time, like several years, but also as competitors in business terms and also as partners. And just yesterday, I was on a talk with uh, Josef Borrell, the high representative of the European uh, Union, who also described Europe's relationship with China as both uh, rival, competitor, and partner. And just as in the United States, economic relations with China are very important. They are in Europe as well. Since 2017, uh, China has been Germany's largest trade partner. And it's reported that a third of the profits made by Daimler, BMW, and Volkswagen are made in China. Uh, and as we saw in the discussions with um, uh, 5G not long ago and the implement, uh, implementation or installation of Huawei equipment, uh, European states differed amongst themselves on what to do about this. Uh, some installed quickly, some did not. Um, and we saw that um, in Germany, for instance, while there was a lot of concerns about security with regard to Huawei, there were probably as many or more concerns about US high tech firms like Google and Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook. And it was the US government after all that was caught tapping uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel's phone, uh, not China. So we have a multi-dimensional relationship in, in all directions. And today we have three very well positioned people to help us sort through the numerous issues and perspectives. We're gonna start with Dr. Yanka Ortel, director of the Asia program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. She previously worked as a senior fellow at the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States in the Berlin office, where she focused on transatlantic China policy, including on emerging technologies, Chinese foreign policy and security in East Asia. I've asked her to take us inside the discussions among policymakers in Europe. We're then to hear from Dr. Richard Cherkani, the program director of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies, as I mentioned, in the Czech Republic. But he's the lead author of a new study entitled European Public Opinion and China in an Age of COVID, Differences and Common Ground Across the Continent. 
And it's a multinational survey of opinion across numerous European states. So from this new data, I've asked him to describe and compare the landscapes in public opinion inside and across numerous European states. Third, we'll turn to Dr. Peter Gries, uh, the Lee Kwa Hung Chair and Director of the University of Manchester's China Institute. I've asked Pete to compare the beliefs in Europe that are unearthed by this new study to those in the United States that he studied extensively. Pete is the author of The Politics of American Foreign Policy, How Ideology Divides Liberals and Conservatives Over Foreign Affairs that he published with Stanford University Press in 2014. And he's also uh, the author of many, many articles on China and Chinese politics. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Orto. Yanka, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Richard, and thank you very much for the kind invitation. And as a little disclaimer, if someone has trouble hearing me, there's a sound card issue, so just up your volume a little bit, then you should be able to perfectly hear me. I will go about the question, um, because it's a very broad subject, I've decided to go about three questions that I will address uh, in greater detail. So how has the China conversation changed in Europe? Um, what does this mean for the special case of Germany? And what are the chances for transatlantic cooperation? And since I have 10 minutes for all of that, you have to excuse a certain <laughs> degree of brevity here on some of the issues. We can go into further details in the discussion. To start with the, how the China conversation has changed to bring everyone kind of on the same page here in the conversation, um, the last two years in the conversation here have changed the entire debate massively. Um, this has started out uh, basically with a paper that was published by the German Federation of Industries, which is an unlikely institution to come forward with a very skeptical position on China. But because it did in early 2019, the report was very well researched, very well done, um, and brought together the big players in the German industry. And all of them say, we have to be careful um, with what we are getting ourselves into. We may have to change our policies vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, the situation for German industry is getting worse on the ground. So we may have to kind of, this, this may require policy change. That was so unusual, um, but because it came about in such a concerted fashion, it really did have an impact on elite conversation, on policymaker conversations all across Europe. As a result of that, in March 2019, um, this was kind of the, the, the groundwork for the strategic outlook document that was then published by the European Commission, which outlined this new holy trinity that Richard was already referring to, this new idea of China being both um, a partner, a, a competitor, an economic competitor, but also a systemic rival. And I will come back to that later on, but this Holy Trinity has been with us since for the, two, for the last two years. There is a rethink in all of the European capitals going on when it comes to China. That's something we can definitely say for sure. There is lots of nuance to the debate though, and that's very much dependent on um, the respective kind of exposure to China, the respective dependence and the respective in uh, economic interactions that we see. The rethink that has taken place on the, um, on the you know, policy level in 2019 did not immediately translate into a rethink on a broad public debate. Um, I think it would be an overstatement to say that this has generated massive public outrage in, in uh, all across Europe. That just wasn't the case at the time. But the 5G conversation and the Huawei conversation, which was sort of emerging simultaneously, did change some of the perceptions also in the broader public and how this, um, how the, kind of, what kind of actor China would be for Europe. The third element that then really changed and had an impact on the conversation was COVID, obviously. Um, COVID and the, the, corona, uh, the coronavirus pandemic brought China sort of home to European citizens. Um, there was a big question about virus coming from China. All of a sudden, China's actions in Europe had an impact on how people were seeing Europe, uh, were seeing China there. And I know that Richard is going to go into this in greater detail, so I'll leave it here. But I think that we have to kind of see the, the, the levels of change in the conversation that have taken place over the last two years. Overall, we see generally higher skepticism among all of the policymakers at the moment. Um, but the, the kind of the dependence issue is the biggest question here and the question of whether there is something to gain. Um, and in, we see in, uh, among policymakers in, in Eastern Europe, um, we see a, a growing reluctance to kind of buy into um, a China agenda. Um, whereas on the other hand, we see um, quite some pro-Chinese narratives coming from the center of Europe. And that may be a bit counterintuitive, but 
Um, I think it's important that we stress that often the 17 plus one format is listed as, you know, the one format that splits Europe, the opportunity for China to split away the East from the center. Whereas in reality, the probably biggest problem for a united China position is Germany. Germany is the largest trading partner um, among the EU countries for China, as Richard has already outlined. But this is not a mere exporting relationship. This German companies are heavily intertwined in the Chinese economic um, and an innovation ecosystem. For German companies, this is really crucial for um, a range of German companies in select industrial sectors. Their China business is absolutely crucial. And this does constrain to a certain degree Berlin's policy options, or at least Berlin perceives, um, Berlin's policymakers perceive that it constrains their policy options. I think that degree of nuance is probably well warranted because we can really argue whether that actually in reality were to constrain the policy options if it would come down to it. There is a need for a real rethink of German China strategy. That is something that is kind of um, clear among many of the more advanced um, thinkers on the issue around Europe, where it's clear that Germany is becoming a hold up to some of the conversations, but this will likely not take place during the Merkel era. Um, we will have elections in September in Germany and in the post Merkel era, the big question will be who is actually benefiting from the China business? Are these just the companies or are these also German voters and taxpayers? Um, it's a bit of the, the conversation that you have in the US in terms of the foreign policy for the middle class conversation that also is drippling into the German context here. Um, the future of, of Germany's industrial and economic future that has often been portrayed as being in China may actually be um, not there, but may actually be um, kind of be actually threatened by the heightened and the growing degree of dependence on the Chinese market. And then maybe just a kind of a hard stop and say, what does that mean for transatlantic cooperation at the moment? Well, honestly, at the outset of the Biden administration, one could have said that this is a no brainer. It makes so much sense for the US and Europe to work together on a joint challenge where the overall assessment is very similar, where the overall kind of uh, understanding of the problem um, and the, the effects that it has are very similar, um, but it's not a no-brainer. Um, the US has, the US administration has come forward, and I think Richard has, has really outlined that really well with Jake Sullivan's remarks, um, that it cannot tackle the non-military China challenge alone. Um, and that's been quite a quite a kind of quite a statement to say that that it needs the allies to actually address this challenge. But the allies haven't fully bought it yet, um, especially in Germany, but also in, in, in Europe more broadly. There's still this kind of hedgy attitude towards it, um, a certain degree of insecurity, an understanding that um, the last four years have really done a lot of damage to transatlantic trust, and therefore there is this degree of trying to find a third way, trying to position Europe somewhere in between China and the U.S trying to avoid making choices. The Munich Security Conference uh, that was taking place in a like slightly um, remote version in uh, last week was I think a good example of that, of kind of a very clear Biden approach and a very hedgy uh, Merkel Macron response to it with little ambition, with little vision and with little concrete for Biden to actually take home with and to say to bank on and to build on. The comprehensive agreement on investment that was con uh, that was like generally agreed upon to be concluded in the future uh, in late December last year and in an 11th hour movement just before the Biden administration was kind of actually in office is a really good example of that. Um, it is not a disastrous document, but it is a strategic mistake because it came at a moment where kind of transatlantic momentum was building and where China was really trying to hedge against that and to split off um, this kind of emerging alliance between the Americans and the uh, Europeans on the economic front or a perceived emerging alliance there. And I think that's really something that um, should serve as a warning and should serve as a lesson of how easily um, Europe can be bought off um, because the commitments that China has made in the comprehensive agreement on investment are relatively weak. Um, there's not that many concessions in there that would really warrant this. Um, and the negotiation tactics have been relatively limited. For example, no ambitious agenda on climate change has been included on the areas that matter for the Europeans, digitalization and the digitalization agenda and the Green Deal agenda. Really nothing major has been achieved in that. And that should be a warning for how to deal with China in the future. I think what we need, and to conclude with that, is a great degree of transatlantic honesty um, in what exactly the problem is that we're facing and where exactly we need it. And then a willingness to put aside the kind of the small differences 
to achieve the big objectives. Um, and I think we are at that stage now where we um, need to step, take a step back from the immediate things that have been on the agenda for the past four years to make room for a bigger question on the systemic rivalry question that we are facing um, that is growing um, and the economic competition question that is growing. And to end with that, I think, Richard, um, you mentioned the Holy Trinity, the, the rival, the competitor, um, and the partner. Um, I think we will not longer get away with that in Europe for a long time. This has been a fantastic way to say that China can be anything for us. It can be everything <laughs> for us, and everyone can find themselves in it. Um, but in increasingly, the partner box is pretty empty. The competitor box is growing increasingly fierce. And on the rivalry side, we haven't even really begun to face up to what we're looking at. So I think Europe will have to face some really tough strategic choices in the future. And I hope that there is going to be enough room for transatlantic cooperation. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Richard, I'm going to turn to you next. You know, I saw your study uh, last year and was really excited about it. I read it carefully, thought it was wonderful. So I'm looking forward to your comments. And I had studied the Pew data of 2020 and noticed in that, that they asked the question, you know, how much does the power and influence of China frighten you or threaten how big a threat do you think it is? And about 40% thought it was in uh, Germany, I mean, in France and about 35% in Germany. But more in both Germany and France thought the power and influence of the United States was an even bigger threat uh, than that. And so I was really interested in seeing your new data where you look at attitudes about China, as well as attitudes about Russia and the United States. So without further ado, uh, Richard, it's up to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. And I want to say that uh, if COVID has brought some advantages, it is certainly that I get to talk much more often to, for instance, US colleagues and uh, I think this is a very good time to exchange views. Um, of course, we have the new US administration. We expect some changes in Europe when it comes to attitudes towards China. So I'm really looking forward, especially to questions and discussion. Uh, I should say that, uh, uh, as was mentioned, uh, my presentation is based on uh, quite large scale uh, research, which also Peter has participated in. And uh, I will only introduce some um, findings, which I thought might be the most uh, relevant, uh, first of all. But then, of course, in the discussion, we can go deeper into uh, actually many directions. Uh, so I will share my screen because I'd like to show um, I'd like to show, uh, show ch charts. So I believe you should be seeing my screen. Is, is that correct? Okay, um, so yeah. So this is, this is uh, one of the key finding, kind of initial finding where we ask uh, in the 13 countries we surveyed, we ask how they feel about China. And um, well, what I can highlight here is that uh, we included uh, Serbia, Russia as the non-EU countries. We included UK, which is now non-EU countries and then 10 EU countries. And you can see that Russia and Serbia really stand out. They do have positive view of China. Um, but on the other side, and this is one of the kind of line which I've tried to emphasize since our findings came out, Europe is often presented as divided, um, very often divided on China. But actually, I think one of our findings is that on many aspects, uh, there are also a lot of simil similarities across Europe. But I mean, of course, there are some differences as well. So let me maybe highlight that, for instance, um, on the very general level, you can say that the Western and Northern you go in Europe, the more negative public opinion to China gets. And then Southern and Eastern Europe would get slightly more positive. So Sweden would be the most negative, uh, followed by some of the Western European countries. Um, this chart, so we only did this survey for the first time, uh, unlike Pew, right, which repeats their survey often, but uh, we did ask respondents um, what they think, how their view of China changed over the past three years. Um, and here UK stands out as the country where about two thirds of respondents say their views of China got worse. Again, Serbia and Russia are the cases of countries where actually majority of people say their views of China got better, especially Serbia, it's 
quite remarkable. Um, we probably might say it's also linked a lot to COVID dynamics where uh, local politicians presented China as uh, helping a lot. Um, so as was as was said, we we did ask a lot of questions also about uh, the the U.S., Russia, and the EU, and uh, across the thirteen across actually the EU countries plus UK, we see that the EU is trusted the most. Um, also, most public want to get aligned with the EU most in terms of foreign policy. Um, most of the time, U.S. comes second. There are some exceptions. For instance, in Slovakia. Um, significant section of society is quite critical of the US and on the other hand is positive about Russia. But then you, you can see, for instance, that in Poland uh, or UK, you see very similar numbers for the trust of the EU and the US, which reflects that these two countries are often perceived as quite um, pro-American. Um, but what, what might be interesting uh, for this discussion is also the attitudes in Germany you can see that very few Germans actually trust the US. Uh, they do trust the EU, they don't trust China and Russia, but their trust of the US is very low. We should say that our uh, data was collected before the elections in the US. Uh, we could um, discuss whether that would change, but I think it might not change uh, quite as much as, as some people might think. I think that uh, some of the skepticism, for instance, in Germany, but in other, um, well, Western European countries, actually, uh, of the US might be deeper than just uh, related to Trump and, uh, and the previous administration. Um, as was also mentioned by Janka, uh, COVID is one of the main driving force of, uh, of the view of China. So we did ask uh, our respondents, what is the first association of China? Um, that was an open question. And we see here the Spanish responses, the Italian responses. So you see that one of the first thing which comes to their mind when it, when it comes to China is COVID. Um, then you get other things as well. Um, what is interesting, there are only few exceptions when co where COVID doesn't get uh, to the top spot. And one is the Czech Republic where actually communism comes as the main label which people um, assign to China, COVID come uh, later. So actually comparing the 13 countries, COVID is the most frequent theme in most of them. But then in Sweden, Czech Republic, themes of dictatorship or communism prevail. And that probably reflects that these countries have, have had quite uh, a lot of tensions in their relations with China, what is often called as world warrior uh, diplomacy on China's side. Um, so when it comes to help during the, during the COVID-19, um, again, this kind of reflects the, the bigger uh, picture, but then, so you see that in Serbia, uh, the help of China is identified the most, uh, interestingly in Italy as well, which might be related to the fact that Italy was the first European country which was hit hard by the virus and uh, very early on, um, there was a bit of an impression, because um, reality might be different, but an impression was created that China has provided a lot of help. Uh, we can get back to this later on, but uh, let me move on. Um, so I, when it comes to policies, when it comes to European policy attitude towards China, it's important to look at how Europeans perceive different aspects of interaction with China. And we ask, um, so Chinese technology, is actually perceived relatively warmly, uh, similarly with trade, but uh, actually it's not so warm if you think that 50 is the neutral label here. So really Chinese technology and trade are the only two aspects which lean somewhat on the positive side. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, and that might be interesting is that China's impact on the global environment gets the most negative perception. And that might again, be reflected in some data which I show later on that the Europeans really perceive as, as a major issue to cooperate with China on issues such as climate change and so on. Uh, what might be of interest here is the Chinese investments, uh, which again uh, are not perceived so uh, positively. So as I said, um, what policies European public prefer, and really there is a bit of a consensus across the countries that 
uh, the, the most preferred policy is the cooperation on global issues. Uh, again, this could be influenced to quite some extent by the fact that we were asking during the COVID pandemic, and we did suggest that the cooperation would include climate change, epidemics, counterterrorism. Uh, addressing cybersecurity came only second, and that's good to um, kind of emphasize that, uh, you know, when, when, when I say that the finding is Europeans want to cooperate with China, it's not that they trust China, quite the opposite. Uh, the findings show Europeans don't trust China. Europeans uh, do recognize some security issues, but these security issues tend to be more cyber security. Europeans don't feel like preventing Chinese geopolitical expansion. That's not something that which would um, rank high on their agenda. Um, this may be also an important finding for transatlantic cooperation, that if this is something which the US administration would like to get Europe on board with, it might meet uh, a bit more skepticism because that's really not uh, so much preferred policy options in Europe. Uh, I'm not gonna stick to this map much, but it's really just showing uh, in more details what I showed in a previous slide. So again, we see that cybersecurity is the most preferred uh, policy choice, for instance, in these three countries here. Uh, we see that Germany, German public prefers cooperation on global issues the most. Uh, Sweden uh, public, Swede, Swedes are the only ones who actually put advancing human rights and democracy as the first. But we also see that other European countries and publics do put uh, human rights and democracy uh, across top priorities. But then again, we see that preventing geopolitical expansion uh, really ranks as either the last or one of the last policy options. Let me show you a few more um, insights into some uh, key countries or some interesting insights. So we're looking now at the, the finding from Germany and we ask German public whether Germany should follow the EU China policy or whether it should lead or whether it should carry an independent China policy. And this is interesting that um, only less than 20% of Germans say Germany should have independent China policy. And uh, really more than half want Germany either to follow or, 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 to, or to lead the EU's, the EU's China policy. Uh, this is another finding in Germany, and I think it um, kind of uh, fits in what uh, Janka was saying just a few minutes ago. So we asked German public whether they think that defending human rights in relation with China comes with economic costs. And majority think there is economic cost. Actually, vast majority think there is economic cost. Uh, but then when we ask the public whether they still want to put more emphasis on human rights in dealings with China, again, majority or uh, more, more people agreed with that than disagreed. So uh, this is very interesting finding, uh, which might go a little contrary to the image that, um, that Germany wants only to make business with China, because actually public in Germany uh, seem to be ready, at least according to this research, to take some economic cost when it comes to dealing with China. Um, let, me, let me show a few more uh, findings from other countries. So this one is, is in Sweden, as, as I said, as I showed you, Sweden has the most negative view of China. It has experienced quite some uh, tensions in diplomatic relations with China. Um, but what is interesting is that even, uh, even though very few Swedes want to cut links to China. So we ask whether Sweden should cut the sister city uh, partnership with Chinese cities, and very few Swedes said, yes, we should cut the sister city links. Uh, similarly, even though the Chinese ambassador in, Germany, in Sweden is very controversial, very few Swedes actually support uh, sending him away. So it seems that even, uh, even though Swedes have negative image of China, uh, they still want to preserve some context there. Now, uh, one of the last uh, slides I'm going to show you is from Latvia, um, because I want to emphasize that what I'm, what I'm showing so far is at the country level, but there are some significant divergences within the countries. And this is one of the biggest in Latvia. So as many would be familiar with, uh, there is a sizable Russian speaker minority in Latvia. And when we look at the differences between Latvian speakers and Russian speakers, we see that Latvian speakers are way more negative about China um, than the Russian speakers. 
Um, finally, this is the um, this slide shows the finding in the Czech Republic over here and the findings in France. And I'm showing this to make my final point. And that is that in the Czech Republic, uh, China is a very polarizing issue. So the voters of the current Czech president are significantly more positive uh, when it comes to China than the voters for the opposing candidate. Um, and that's even more interesting when you compare it with the uh, findings in France, where uh, Macron and Le Pen might be very different politicians, but actually their voters have almost no difference when it comes to China. And let me finish with this, that um, I kind of said that there are a lot of similarities across the continent um, across, when, when it comes to kind of negative and worsening image of China. There are similarities when it comes to policy preferences. Um, but what makes actually uh, Western European countries a bit different from the Eastern European countries is that in the East, China seems to be more of a polarizing issue. China seems to be a bit of a, a bit an issue of an identity uh, rather than maybe issue of really business and so on. So let me finish here. I'm looking forward to uh, discussions. Thank you very much, Richard. That was terrific. Uh, we're going to turn now to Peter Gries. And I'd be remiss if I didn't welcome him back to Mershon. Uh, Peter was a postdoc here some time ago. Both of us, neither of us had any gray hair back then. <laughs> Pete, it's great to have you. <laughs> Pete, it's great to have you back. Uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Rick. And it's a thrill for me to be back. Um, I have very fond memories of Columbus and the Mershon Center. And uh, you know, it was after finishing my PhD at Berkeley, and it was an opportunity for the, the inner political psychologist in me to emerge, um, surrounded by you and Ned and Marilyn. And uh, I really feel like it's been a blessing in a way in my second career, uh, learning psychology and um, moving in that direction. Okay, I'm gonna share screen now. Let's see if this works. Um, Okay. Somebody just holler at me if they're not seeing my screen. I'm gonna assume that everyone can hear. Um, I'm gonna start with a couple of headlines in the New York Times over the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, Yanka started us off by, by talking about um, the coverage of the, the Europe-China trade deal. Um, and I, I think I agree with her that it is a strategic mistake and the press made a big deal out of it. Um, but I think what I really wanna do is argue that it's making a mountain out of a molehill. And I'm gonna make that, that argument um, from the bottom up and from the US side over um, by trying to point out uh, some of the things that both Yanka and Richard have already pointed out about shared concerns about very basic things like human rights um, and uh, democracy. Um, and the way I'm gonna do that is by starting with the book that Rick nicely uh, plugged for me earlier, uh, my last book, which focused on how Americans, whoops, are divided um, in their views of the world, including China. Um, this was the sort of main uh, figure in the book uh, around which the whole book was organized. Um, basically, what this uh, plots is the difference between uh, self-identified liberals and conservatives in their feelings towards foreign countries. And what's immediately apparent is a, a very broad trend um, that conservatives just tend to feel much cooler towards foreign countries than liberals do. Um, within that context, you know, China is not unusual. Um, conservatives don't like countries like China. Um, and in fact, it's not even an extreme case. Uh, I had a whole chapter on the United Nations, um, France, uh, European Union, Mexico, massive differences. It's almost like Americans, liberal and conservative Americans literally see different worlds. And that got me very interested. And briefly, the China chapter, um, in order to explain, so to explain the overall variation, why uh, so much more negative about certain 
uh, attitude objects internationally than others, I ended up resorting to looking at subdimensions of ideology. And three of the four that I focused on were basically the culture wars, um, questions of economic redistribution, and what I called political uh, ideology or a libertarian to communitarian continuum. And what, what, what would lead to really large overall differences between liberals and conservatives in the United States in their international attitudes were when these different dimensions or different kinds of liberals and conservatives uh, for different reasons would end up either disliking or, or liking China. In this case, um, you know, basically our, our, our sort of uh, cultural conservatives, the Christian right in the United States is very anti-communist, which then shapes their views of China. In fact, my whole interest in the role of ideology and understanding how Americans uh, view China came from an early finding that um, people who were pro-life were also anti-China. And it just seemed like such two distal things. I had to figure out what that was about. And this is it. Uh, people who are pro-life um, are religious people and they view China through this communist lens and communism is atheism. Um, just as another quick example, you know, China is seen as a socialist country and liberals who tend to uh, favor economic redistribution, they're, mo they're more happy about that. Conservatives see that as, as a, a threat to property. So long debates over these kinds of issues within the US. Now that's what the book was about, um, but there was sort of more fundamental data in the US data set that I never uh, really addressed, which is trying to understand the overall pattern of where China fed in, uh, felt, uh, fit in to the broad worldview of all Americans. So why do Americans in general feel warmly towards some countries like the UK, Japan, Israel, Germany on the right, and very coolly towards countries like North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, China. Um, and so I went back to that question in a later uh, bit of research that I did with, with some colleagues on the democratic piece. And that took me to Western European data. And um, what, what we have here is data combined from samples taken by YouGov on, on my behalf uh, in the UK, France, and Germany. So I've aggregated those all into a Western Europe. And what's striking here is how similar the sequence is that you have, you know, basically free countries on the right, liberal democracies, and you have countries that are seen as increasingly unfree to the left. And so the way I just, we decided to explore this was to use Freedom House data, which on an annual basis rates how free different countries are and just doing a, a simple uh, plot, and there was a strong zero order correlation between how Americans felt towards different countries, how warmly they felt towards them, and how free they were. So the, the, basically the paper ended up uh, then more rigorously testing with regression analysis, this finding against uh, counter arguments such as the commercial piece, the idea that actually we like countries that we trade with, um, or realist counter arguments that, um, you know, we, we fear powerful states. Um, but in fact, it held up very well. So basically what this research does is it supports the Kantian idea um, that democratic publics, uh, they like fellow democracies, they like other free countries, and they dislike non-democracies. Um, in fact, Hume had this wonderful turn of phrase that uh, democratic publics uh, maintain an imprudent vehemence towards non-democracies. Um, and this, I think, very much captures um, much threat perception in the West right now vis-a-vis -vis China. So to kind of sum up the, the findings of this earlier research, a shared liberalism, um, I believe, predisposes Western publics to be fearful of non-democracies. And China is no exception to that. Uh, but there are cleavages within um, different Western uh, polities, as uh, Richard just uh, alluded to in, in the Czech Republic, which I'll get back to. Um, in Western Europe and the United States, there's a clear distinction between liberals and conservatives. In Central Europe and Eastern Europe, those divisions can be slightly different. So this takes me back to Richard's first slide, which now allows me to travel back across the Atlantic uh, to, to Europe. And what I'm gonna ask is how do you explain variation uh, vertically here? 
So why is it, uh, and actually it's, it's, it's the, the pattern that, um, that Richard already pointed out, that it's the Western and Northern European countries that, that end up being um, at, at the public, broad public opinion level that end up being uh, the most negative about China. And it's the Eastern and more Southern that end up being warmer. So in this case, we have Russia and Serbia. And I want to suggest that it's the same kind of Kantian logic of a democratic peace, that the, the, the more committed to liberal democracy, a particular public, so at the national level or a sub-public, as Richard was just talking about, opposition to uh, President uh, Zeman in Czech, the progressive um, uh, followers of Václav Havel, you know, those are the kinds of publics who are going to have a kind of deep-rooted hostility and fear of a country that is not seen as democratic. So what does that mean? Does that mean that there is this split between East and West? And uh, you yeah, referred uh, to the recent 17 plus one um, meeting as well. That was covered widely in China. Um, uh, Xi Jinping himself hosted this last meeting. Um, and the Chinese press covered it as this, you know, wonderful example of Chinese cooperation with Central and Eastern European countries. Um, but actually, I think there's a very strong argument to be made that it failed completely. And it's, it's showing signs that it's, it's outlived its, its utility. Um, the, the guidelines that came out of it, um, I think they were called the Beijing Agenda, uh, did not even talk about uh, a future plan. Um, so even in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, or the majority of them, that would be most inclined to be sort of um, more receptive to an authoritarian China, for a variety of reasons, um, they're starting to look West. Um, there's a large group of them that feel like China has not delivered on its economic promises. Um, there's another group that is increasingly concerned about Russia and the threat that Russia uh, poses for them. So even in, and especially, perhaps especially among many of these um, Eastern and Central European countries, uh, the policies towards China have been much more restrictive. So Huawei, for example, um, has really gone nowhere in Central and Eastern Europe with a very important exception of of Serbia. Um, and that's something that, that needs to be addressed. But for the most part, all of these countries have been leaning uh, towards the United States. Um, I don't have time to go through this in too much detail. This next slide shows that sometimes you have to get at the subnational level to see which publics have this sort of progressive view of China as potentially a threat. Um, so in the Czech Republic, again, this is uh, similar data to what Richard just showed. Um, Zeman voters are much more pro-China uh, and the opposition voters are, are much more anti-China, much more pro-US. Um, among Latvian voters, you have Latvian speakers versus Russian speakers who have massively different views of Russia and China. Russia looms very large. Uh, this is from a paper that Richard and I are actually working on currently, trying to understand the drivers of attitudes towards China. And I, I don't wanna go into it in too much detail right now, but um, the point of this is to show that how Central and Eastern Europeans self-identify, whether they see themselves as more Western or Eastern, has a big impact on how they view China. But that impact is usually mediated through how they remember their own communist pasts, how they think about communism as a system, and ultimately how they think about China. Um, so as Richard pointed out, in the Czech Republic, um, you have a very evenly divided society where you have one group that is very Western oriented and one is very Eastern oriented, and they have very different attitudes towards the Czechoslovakian past and communism and Russia. And all of those things shape their views of China. But in another set of countries like Poland, um, and also the Baltic countries like Latvia. Russia is just such a, an overwhelming presence on their border, um, especially since the annexation of Crimea over the last several years, um, that it's almost like these countries can't see China directly. Their view of China is completely obfuscated 
by their view of Russia. Um, and so Russia is arguably uh, pulling China down uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And I don't think you can really completely understand um, the, what is looking to be a, a serious failure with 17 plus one um, if you don't take into account Russia. So uh, I, I guess where, where this leaves me, um, yeah, and this I, I think Richard already, already showed this, is basically um, to argue that I don't agree with the prog uh, prognosticators of doom at the New York Times and elsewhere. Um, I believe that there are broad, there is broad public consensus on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, across a wide variety of countries among publics that are concerned about issues like democracy and human rights. You're gonna see different coalitions getting together on different issues. Uh, Hong Kong, you know, you're gonna see the UK playing a lead, lead, leading role in issues like uh, the genocide in Xinjiang. Others will play leading roles. Um, obviously, you know, in countries like Germany that have heavy investments in China, you know, they're gonna push forward with things like the investment agreement, but that doesn't mean the Germans themselves um, as a people aren't extremely concerned about human rights issues. In fact, that was one of my earliest puzzles was looking at some earlier European data and discovering that it's the Germans who have the most invested in China, the German public that is actually the most cynical about China. And it doesn't really surprise me given the German experience of the Cold War. Um, and I guess we need to grow comfortable with the Holy Trinity, I guess. And I, I think I agreed with Yanka's overall assessment of it, but we need to understand that we live in an interdependent world and it's not a zero sum game. It's not, you know, if China gets a deal on economics, then it's all over. No, these are increasingly multifaceted relationships and arguably that's much more the case in Europe today than it was five, 10 years ago. It used to be that only the US was even thinking about security issues. Now, COVID-19, uh, Huawei, uh, Hong Kong, um, Xinjiang, um, China has become securitized in Europe as well. And so what you're gonna see is, is people having to deal with this balance, uh, the Holy Trinity, um, and yes, well, it'll be interesting to, to follow who the players are that uh, emphasize the rivalry, the competition and the partnership. And I agree with Yanka that it is very telling that an industry group, you know, would, would um, come out of the partner shell. And in fact, it reminds me of what happened in the U.S. Was it five, 10 years ago when uh, the U.S. China Business Council and, and others who traditionally had been very, very pro-China all of a sudden step back from their pro-China position and the Republican party, all of a sudden there was a tilt and Main Street conservative antipathy towards China took over. And now the Republican party um, is ending up being much tougher on China as a result. I don't know if that something similar could happen in Germany. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, that was terrific. Thank you all, uh, Richard and Yanka as well. We have over 130 attendees and they're starting to file questions in and I invite all of you to send your questions in the Q&A function. And then I'll try to ask them maybe in sometimes clusters or try to make it as coherent as we can. But we have one that's come up right away that's sort of methodological and maybe I'll give it to Yanka because she's not using public opinion data. Someone's asking, uh, how relevant uh, public attitudes are in the policy discussions and uh, what kind of influence do they have over the policies towards China in Europe? So all three are invited to speak, but maybe Yanka, since you uh, are in that policy world, you could uh, start. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the results. We do a lot of polling at ECFR as well. Um, and I think it is for us, it is always surprising to sometimes see public polling data and then policy decisions on the other end. Uh, they do not necessarily correspond. And on the China issue, I think both Peter and Richard have pointed out how sometimes it can be actually really confusing to look at the public opinion data and to look at the policy that actually results. To a degree, I think it really depends on what Peter has said, that um, it depends on kind of, does, it, uh, does, does a certain policy position fall on fertile ground? 
publicly, um, or does it matter? And I think that was the, the Italy data that Richard has, um, has quoted, I think is a really good one to look at, where you can see that there was a political party in Italy that utilized the conversations around China for its domestic policy making, utilized it for its domestic policy debates. Whereas in other um, countries, and I would include the one that I'm sitting in right now in Germany, China has not become, well, it, you know, well, Peter's completely right in terms of the attitudes of the German public in general, but if they would have to rank it um, on a total importance of policy issues overall, the issue would still not be in the top tier. So I think it depends on whether the issue has been politicized at home, uh, whether the issue is someone that policy elites play with at the moment in terms of their kind of domestic constituencies and how to win them over, um, or whether it is completely still in a realm where it's, it's not on the importance level so high. Um, so in general, I would say the um, policy elite conversation um, in shaping foreign policy in Europe matters more than public opinion at the moment still, if you, if you want to like broad brush it. Um, and the, that's what I think should be of concern to the Chinese leadership, because the elite conversation has moved quite a bit. Um, and we will see and continue to monitor how that will have an impact on policy choices in the longer run. Good. Um, Peter or Richard, you want to add anything? Go ahead. Richard. Please jump in. Uh, I'm, I, I, I'm quite in line with what uh, Janka said. What I would uh, add is, uh, well, certainly when an issue becomes politicized issue, when it be becomes sensitive issue, then there is a greater space, greater potential for public to play a role. I'm sitting in the Czech Republic. I think this is the country where it is politicized. And in general, as I said, it seems that in the West, maybe interestingly, there is more of a consensus and China is not such a sensitive topic. And it's interesting that in more in the Central and East, where China actually doesn't play so much economic role, it is, as I said, a bit of a you know identity issue and it's a bit of a politicized issue and so on. So that's one thing. But then our data, for instance, showed there are some correlations between the 5G attitudes of the people and then and of the of the governments. So that's one thing I would say. And uh, we don't have data to prove that. But uh, public opinion is often discussed that it's a predictor of future policies. And um, the investment agreement with China, which was agreed actually, as Yanka said, on the level of political elites, but now the European Parliament must uh, approve that. And you know, it doesn't seem at the moment it would be a very smooth process. And, and part of the reason is that many MEPs might actually just veto it because of the public opinion. So then at the end, this is, I think, what, what, what I would suggest that when, you know, China now is perceived very negatively, and, you know, just very briefly, if you look at the European discussion about the investment agreement, the discussion is pretty much presented, do we want to make agreement with China, which is committing human rights atrocities? And, you know, this is how the question stands. And I assume for many MEPs, it's very difficult to say, we will still approve the deal. So in this situation, you know, you, you can see that the public opinion can play a very big role, but only at, uh, in some situations. Okay, thank you. Pete, did you want just to, to echo that? Richard? Yeah, just to briefly echo Richard, you know, in the literature in, in the study of American foreign policy, uh, they talk about the electoral connection. And that's what, uh, there's not as much research on that in the European context, but that's exactly what Richard is describing, that politicians want to be reelected. And that's why they pay attention to public opinion. And so to the extent that, you know, it's seen as kissing Chinese ass, you know, some MPs may not want to do that if they want to get that get reelected. Uh, that's the indirect effect of public opinion on foreign policy making. There's also a direct effect that isn't as discussed, but it's the, the basic idea that's so obvious no one thinks about it, which is politicians are people too. And they're socialized in the same polities as, you know, the, the people who compose public opinion. So, you know, a Swedish leader, um, a German leader is going to be socialized in a space where they care about huma uh, human rights and democracy. Angela Merkel cares about human rights and democracy. So she has been sensitive on that issue. She also has to be concerned about the automakers and their investments in China. Um, and of course, elite dynamics will shape how that plays out. Um, but politicians themselves are influenced by 
the societies within which they're socialized. And so that's one sort of deep way in which, uh, or indirect way, oh, that's, a, that's a more direct way in which um, these findings about the roles of, for example, identities and ideologies, how they might actually shape policy outcomes. But I, I do agree that um, the links are more tenuous in the European context than they appear to be in the US context. Let me move to something quite concrete. Uh, we have several questions that deal with Taiwan. And one from my colleague at the John Glenn School for Public Policy, Rudy Hightower, wonders just uh, how far would the United States and Europe go in the defense of Taiwan? And to what degree is the, or how big is the gap between American and European rhetoric when it comes to a tough policy towards China and really doing something at flashpoints let's say, like Taiwan, if uh, this situation continues to escalate and the Biden administration follows the Trump administration of increasing uh, pseudo recognition of Taiwan. So I, I guess that's open to all of you, but it brings us from the abstract down to the very concrete. Um, what do you think European attitudes are about defending Taiwan? happy to give a, a quick take if you like, but I think that um, it's an interesting case where COVID has had the opposite effect, um, where the coronavirus crisis has really contributed to a more negative view of China in Europe. It has actually put Taiwan on the map for many Europeans, which is a surprising result of the pandemic um, because of the way it has handled the crisis. Um, I think in general, though, it still means that the interest level uh, and the situational awareness of the problem in, in, uh, that, we, that, the, that is facing the Taiwan Strait, it's not quite there yet where it needs to be um, with regard to also European interest more broadly. But we see an, like a nascent shift here. We, if you follow kind of German or French reporting in the media, um, you all of a sudden have these longer reports about what the situation is like. So if there's a growing a realization, there is a realization that the tech powerhouse, the semiconductor powerhouse, Taiwan is something that is quite relevant for the European economy. Um, but if you were to ask me whether the Europeans would be um, willing to kind of throw their entire military weight um, uh, in, in, uh, in the ring um, at the moment that there is a conflict right now, I would be more skeptical. I, I would just add two, two things also from our, our data, right? I emphasize that uh, Europeans don't want to kind of play any geopolitical games with China. This is just, um, you know, this is the finding from the data. And I think there would be a difference between the European and maybe American attitude when it comes to even use of military power and so on. So that's one thing. And the second thing, um, I agree that in recent, actually years, um, Europe was more kind of making steps toward Taiwan. Uh, COVID ac accelerated this, but there were even some, um, I would say, um, kind of positive directions in this in, in this regard. Uh, but what, what is interesting, you know, in August, September, a Czech Senate president visited Taiwan, which was unprecedentedly high level visit uh, in decades from Europe. And to my knowledge, uh, the EU was not very happy with that. There were some you know, I was told that kind of the, the EU diplomats weren't very happy about that because it, is, it was perceived as a provocative step, which could, you know, uh, maybe in views of some unnecessarily create, you know, some difficult situations. So um, this is just my observation on the question that I really don't see, um, as Janka said, any, any kind of European will to play a military role uh, over Taiwan. Although maybe just to add briefly on that, it's really surprising that the German foreign minister actually jumped to the assistance of the Czech parliamentary president to be there while Wang Yi was in town. Uh, so it's actually, that was what was actually seen as quite a major step of saying, mm -hmm. you cannot tell us what not to do when our parliamentarians travel, um, was bolder than the German foreign ministry normally is on these issues. So maybe we're seeing a trend here as well emerging. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. This was... I think this was, a, first of all, he was the only only other European leader who was this open. And I think it was also because of the context, right? That they had a common press conference and the issue came up and probably if he didn't say anything, it would really, you know, he could be criticized quite a lot for just letting his European partner down. Um, but yeah, that was very interesting, I agree. We have a couple questions. I'll try to package them together into a single theme, which really ask, for you to think about relative power the European and Americans have vis-a-vis -vis China 
when it chooses to use economic counter moves. And for example, they say, think about the economic pressure China is now putting on Australia for, little, for political purposes. And the question asks, can the EU and the UK and US successfully resist China's power given its willingness to use it uh, in this economic way? And in a kind of related question um, is asked, HSBC has just moved to Asia and sold its US part. You know, how meaningful is that? I, I guess it, it goes with a, several other questions. It's just ask about is, a, is China's economic power and its willingness to use that in obvious coercive ways. Now at a point where it, you, EU and the US is not likely to resist it. Anyone? Pete, you wanna start? Maybe I'll jump in first since I'm, I'm actually, I see myself as a political psychologist rather than a political economist. It lets me be outsider a little, but I, I, I am just struck by how um, power tends to be treated in a very reductionist zero sum manner. So the idea that, you know, for example, if, if China has uh, bought a lot of US treasury bills that somehow China has leverage over the United States. Um, in fact, my understanding is it's exactly the opposite that the US government sets the value of the US dollar. And therefore the US government is the one that has the ability to basically set the value of Chinese reserves that are held in US dollars. This is just an example of the nature of interdependence. Um, in the higher education sector, there is tremendous discussion in the UK right now about um, sort of British vulnerability to China on, in the higher education sector. Um, so many Chinese students uh, paying tuition and, and spending money that U UK higher education needs. Well, yes, that's true, um, but they need the UK too in part because the traditional places where China has had a close economic uh, higher ed exchange and students like Australia and the United States have really kind of fallen apart. So in a way, you know, sometimes there's a failure to understand the nuances of interdependence and to see um, economic power as kind of a one-way street. Um, so I, I guess that's kind of a broad response. You're, you're muted, Yanka. Oh, should be better now, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, so from maybe from, from the kind of angle of what is currently happening from the Chinese side, what we can see is that the measures that the Chinese side has taken, that Beijing has taken to um, actively make use of the idea of economic coercive tools that it can use, it just kind of enhances its toolbox. And that doesn't mean that all of these tools are going to be employed and that they're all going to be employed at the same time, but basically the conditions are being shaped in terms of export control law, et cetera, to be able to have the legal means and to have the tools uh, at hand to exert this kind of pressure. And in that case, kind of Australia is more like a test case still because it's not going through these uh, mechanisms, but in general, it has the potential to really squeeze European companies, for example, between US and Chinese regulation, which will put them in a really, really difficult situation. So I do think that um, it is high time that transatlantically, there is a good agreement about how and when to use coercive economic measures, um, to be very careful using them against allies, um, to be very careful in how to kind of, uh, how we enhance the toolboxes more and more and more and more and how to, how to undermine or how far we undermine the existing economic order um, because vis-a-vis -vis China, it kind of doesn't help us create an additional leverage. We need to beef up our defenses in that regard very much. Um, but I think it's more the, the question of um, how do we want to frame this conversation? Do we want to frame it that in a, in a way that the weaponization of economic interdependence becomes the norm? Or are we still capable of uh, kind of um, disarmament measures in that regard and to just kind of toning down those conversations. I'm not sure whether that is still possible, but it should be the aim of the transatlantic partners in this regard. I'm going to read this one so I get it right. And I think it's um, probably aimed at Richard, I think will be the most, the first one. Do you believe if this split between Northern and Western and Eastern and Southern European countries exist, that there is also an internal economic correlation? If so, do you believe that the next generation EU program can decrease this split and bring even closer the Eastern Southern countries in favor of a stronger transatlantic relationship? 
Okay, I'm not sure if I understand correctly, but uh, you know, Eastern and Southern European countries are somewhat more positive about China. But if you look, you know, I think the question uh, missed an interesting kind of point that uh, it is actually Germany and France who are quite skeptical and negative about the US. So when you ask about transatlantic relationship, it is Poland, but actually Hungary, that's very interesting. Hungary is one has a very kind of friendly approach politically towards China, but the public of Hungary is not so positive about China. Secondly, and Hungarian public is quite positive about uh, about, about the U.S. I mean, even Orbán's policy uh, was well. He especially was a fond of Trump's administration. So uh, you know, I wouldn't make this distinction. You know, I mean. So actually, Central Eastern European countries are often more pro-US than they are pro-Brussels. Um, so that's maybe what I would mention. And uh, maybe someone can add uh, Pete or Yanka, uh, because the question is the, complex. The question of investments. Maybe just to step back a little bit and not go directly into the next generation EU, uh, EU um, possibilities and the investments that are coming from that end. I think one lesson learned from the 2008 financial crisis was that if we, um, from a German side, um, if we push countries to kind of, uh, privatize their infrastructure, to privatize their ports, et cetera, they will look for the money wherever it comes from. And at the time, it was Chinese investment that was coming in. Now, I think it is less consequential than it has often been displayed in terms of political dependencies that this has actually created, thinking about the Port of Piraeus or something like that. But in general, I think there is an awareness that there needs to be European investment um, when there is a, a strategic understanding that we have strategic infrastructure, strategic industries that we want to have protected. And I think that's a bit the lesson learned that is now within the kind of post-COVID recovery work that is being done, that these investments should go there and that they should go across the board in Europe, in these industries for the future, in the infrastructure of the future, because that's not something where Chinese investment is preferable to have uh, on the European side. That is not saying that that investment would be pouring in in the first place under the current conditions. But in general, I think there is a new understanding that that 2008 approach might have been a bit of a mistake at the time. Okay, uh, there, there's two, two questions that I'm, they're not packaged together directly, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because they refer to sort of specific stimuli beside, beside China that might be affecting these data. One is by my colleague, John Mueller, who asks, to what degree does the Kosovo 1999 conflict affect opinion in Serbia today? And the other one is, to what degree do these results um, reflect Trump and the Trump America first uh, in terms of European attitudes, uh, certainly toward the United States, but also indirectly then toward China? So you can take them separately or uh, together, but they are other things besides China could be affecting some of these attitudes, I guess. Uh, Richard, do you have a sense of the uh, legacy of Kosovo and the 99 conflict uh, in Serbia? Is, is, and then yeah, it and our, our data also shows that, you know, Serbia is the only country in Europe who has highly positive image of China's military. Anyone else in Europe, you, when you ask them, you know, do you see Chinese military positive or negative? They see it negatively. Even Russia is kind of neutral. Serbia sees Chinese military as positive. Um, I would say, you know, that's uh, very much linked to the to the NATO bombing when the Chinese embassy was hit, was hit in Belgrade. And you might you might be familiar that uh, the site of the former Chinese embassy in Belgrade is now some sort of Chinese cultural center, and the Serbian and Chinese leaders repeatedly mentioned that this is something which linked their country together. So, you know, the whole 99 bombing became sort of, you know, a strategic part of strategic culture of, uh, of uh, Serbia and really something on which uh, Serbian Chinese um, bilateral relation is based. Uh, so that's one thing uh, with the, the Trump and, uh, and America first. So, I mean, obviously everyone would probably understand that this sort of approach is not gonna win much sympathies anywhere, right? Um, so that's, that's the first thing. As I said in my initial remark, I think that the low, um, actually surprisingly low image of the US in some European countries, such as in Germany uh, and in Western European countries would be 
influenced by, by the four years of Trump. But uh, again, I really don't think that right now we would see a massive change because of course we have a new administration. The new administration is uh, saying things which Europeans like to hear, but uh, I think it hasn't been said so far, but many in Europe are worried what comes in four years. And, uh, and I think, you know, um, and that, that is really something that before, you know, the trust must be regained. That, that, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That's not kind of my impression, that's my uh, interpretation of uh, both our data, but also what I'm observing around. I would like to make a little footnote there. Uh, I fully agree with you, but I, I would like to just make a footnote there on, in, in terms of saying um, the, the fact that uh, we are worried about what comes in four years, and I think that's very prevalent in Germany and German attitude, may blind us to what is happening during those four years. Uh, and that is kind of the developments that are taking place in China, the economic edge and innovation that uh, China is generating, and the fact that we may create conditions on the ground that then in the end will make us more kind of strategically autonomous vis-a-vis -vis the US, but more strategically dependent on China. And I think we have to be very careful in Europe uh, what, how strongly we want to focus and emphasize on what will happen in four years time in the US and how much we should actually be focused on what needs to be done right now, what is politically necessary to make this happen, to make kind of the, to exert leverage at a time when we still have it. I, I would just add a word on, on Serbia, just uh, not because I'm an expert, but because um, I recently read, there's an excellent uh, CSIS report um, John, if you're interested, it's, I think it's called uh, Becoming China's Client State, and it's, it's in very alarming terms about uh, their analysis of uh, Chinese influence in Serbia, particularly in terms of Huawei's penetration and the potential future uh, legacy that could have on European integration. Um, but what's interesting about the report, I think, is that they, they argue, they they argue that a, a big motive for it, and again, this is getting at the thrust of, of your question, John, is, is that it's about Russia. It's about Serbian leaders, as much as they're leaning towards Moscow um, in opposing the US for a variety of reasons and, and sort of having distance from the EU, uh, they're also concerned about putting all their eggs in the Russian basket. And so there's this thought that uh, Serbian leaders are leaning towards China for that reason. And that's a big finding from our survey as well. Again, is Russia looms very, very large in the ways that many of these Eastern and Central European countries think about China. I want to use this, and, and then Janka mentioned uh, what needs to be done in necessary terms and the like. To segue, we only have 15 minutes left. Time is running fast. But uh, I want to focus now, at last for you, what should be done? What should we do uh, sort of push you? And we have a whole slew of questions I've been sort of saving for this. Let me ask one of them in this way. How do we support the Chinese people in their journey to eventually gain their basic human rights without granting more economic power to the CCP? There are other questions about the Uyghur and what can be done to help them. But the general uh, thrust of this basket of questions is what can the EU and the US do that would be effective in, um, on the human rights front in China. You all are China specialists, so. Uh. <laughs> I'll just be the short thing. Uh, I think my short response would be that EU and uh, US should put our own houses in order. Um, because, you know, looking at many of the Chinese human rights activists, civil society and so on, they have been terribly disappointed by the last year, maybe by the last four years. And uh, whether we like it or not, a lot of the credibility of the EU and the US has been, uh, has been decreased. Um, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm very sad about that and I hope I'm wrong, but this is kind of what I'm, what I'm observing. You're muted again, uh, Janka, you're muted. Always a bit delayed, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's not muted but it okay. is so i have to be just slower a bit i guess um so, so i would say in general um there is there are limited tools available to europe and the united states on that front but at least we should use the ones that we have to the fullest 
And I think especially um, the economic dimension here and holding our own companies accountable is a good um, point to start. And it kind of feeds into what Richard has been saying. Um, the supply chain law that has just been kind of um, uh, has been decided upon in Germany is one of those steps in that regard where the companies then have to prove whether there's forced labor in their supply chain. You know, these are areas in which Europeans can regulate their own companies and by regulating their own companies, hold them accountable also for their actions in China and then not further contributing to the situation on the ground. So I think that's a small step, but it's one step in which um, we actually have the agency and the immediate power to do something about this. Obviously, keeping in touch and, and, and doing all of the kind of individual um, human rights work that, that countries are doing, where Germany, because I've been bashing Germany a lot in my conversation, but Germany has actually played a very positive role in terms of individual diplomacy with regard to human rights cases, human rights lawyers, et cetera. That's really important to keep it up and to never be quiet about it. But I think, you know, you have to be clear about um, that the economic level might be the bigger one. I would say that um, another thing looking uh, between countries rather than within, although I agree with both of those comments, is to work together to uh, expect and reiterate uh, a desire for reciprocity. Um, you know, if, if countries are going to be divided and separated, you know, the idea that um, uh, there should be reciprocal treatment, whether it's in investment sphere, uh, trade sphere, um, or on basic issues of press freedoms or whatever the domain is, um, we need to, to expect reciprocity when dealing with China. And when we can work together with our allies, I think it becomes a lot more possible um, to generate movement. Um, the question was very well phrased though. And I, I, I do wanna just add that it's very important that we think carefully, especially about economic sanctions. I, I share a lot of Anka's concerns uh, because I think there can be a real a danger that um, measures that in, are intended to punish the Chinese Communist Party end up punishing the Chinese people. And we don't want to be doing that. We want to be part of uh, the Chinese people's rise um, out of poverty. Um, it already, there, there has been great progress, but much work needs to be done. And uh, we have to be part of a, a goal of all boats rising um, rather than contributing to a kind of zero sum uh, rhetoric, whether it's in the economic or security spheres. One of the biggest differences in the Pew data uh, of 2020 between the United States and Europe in terms when they asked about what are the most important foreign policy priorities your country faces in many of the Germany and France, climate change is right at the top of that. And in the United States, it was fourth, fifth, sixth. Now the Biden administration has certainly elevated the importance of climate change. Um, I don't know just how far, but certainly more than it, than it was. But I, I use it as a preamble because we have a couple of questions that ask about uh, China, the new Green Deal, is China a reliable partner in any kind of climate change effort? There are the couple questions or comments that suggest a government that doesn't trust its own people can't be trusted to be a partner on any of this and make good on its deals. So I guess I'm, it's a general uh, topic summing together a number of these questions though. Uh, what can be done realistically and um, effectively on the climate change front um, if the EU and the United States want to make this a top foreign policy priority when it comes to China? Um, I, can, I can give it a little bit of a go here. Um, the, uh, can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Um, so we've just finished um, a, a study, um, it's called Climate Superpowers. Um, you can get on the ECFR website, obviously. <laughs> Um, that looks into this little um, conversation around China as a partner for climate change. And it was kind of based on a realization that every time you ask diplomats across Europe about, okay, so we have the Holy Trinity, but what's in that partner box? Let me know what's in it. I want to know exactly where are we partners? The answer would in 99.9% .9 of the time be uh, climate change. And I felt it was a bit too of a default response. And so we tried to take this apart a little bit. 
and see what are the areas within the climate conversation that we actually can cooperate on? What are the areas where we actually just require Chinese domestic action? What are the areas in which we are fierce competitors for green technologies, for example, and standards and market access, et cetera? So I think the first and most important thing is that we take this kind of fluffy climate change conversation a bit apart and, and make it less um, mystified as something that is kind of generally good, generally something that we can cooperate on, generally something of a greater kind of global good. Um, it has various levels and we can cooperate with China on standards for sustainable finance. We can look into kind of how do we restructure debt in the developing world so that we create fiscal space for green action. But we have to be aware of the fact that we're going to fiercely, fiercely uh, compete on you know, who builds the wind energy um, of the, the turbines of the future, who builds the solar panels of the future, and who has access to really critical strategic locations in that regard. Um, so that would be my five cents to the topic um, of just kind of making it a little more complicated, which is always great. <laughs> uh, maybe, oh, Pete, go ahead. No, you go ahead, it's fine. Okay, I just wanted to say briefly that uh, Europe is not kind of making choice between the US and China. So, and also our, our data show that, and that's also a common sense. So sometimes the discussion is that Europe between US and China, whether Europe is moving closer to China or to, to, to the US, I, I really don't think that that's what we are observing. Uh, as was mentioned before, Europe wants to be somewhere in between. It seems that there is no appetite for just kind of embracing everything, for instance, what the US is doing. So Europe wants to be somewhere in between, but certainly not in the middle. So that's something I wanted to say. And um, on the question of, you know, who, who is more reliable or serious partner, um, I think that, and again, our data shows that again, you know, the, the, the findings should not be interpreted that China is trusted, reliable partner to work with on the climate change or on other issues, quite the opposite. Uh, I think the data shows, and that's also what you hear a lot in Europe, China is unavoidable partner. It's someone you just have to work with. You cannot overlook it. And really, I think the realization came with the pandemic. I mean, you, you cannot see a more you know, obvious example of how you have to work with China on some global issues because otherwise it can simply create problems. This is not a zero sum game when it comes to pandemic, climate change, and so on and so on. So I just wanna say that very often this partner, I, I also don't understand very well what the partner rival competitor means, but I certainly think that it doesn't mean that China is a partner, a friend in a naive sense. And very often this, this, this is kind of mentioned. Uh, and I, I suspect many people think that that's what it says. And I really don't think it does. Yeah, there, there simply are issues that cannot be resolved without working together. I mean, this is said so many times, you know, China is a numbers game. It's just so massive. You're not gonna resolve climate issues health issues uh, without working with China. Um, but that doesn't mean, as, as Yanka points out, that that's just squarely in the partner zone. Um, but that also doesn't mean that a big part of it is in the competition zone, such as uh, solar panels or, you know, that competition can be a good thing. And maybe that can be part of uh, resolving the issue as well. Um, but the basically China's involvement with the world has just become more multifaceted as China has grown. And it is unavoidably a part of resolving or not resolving a variety of issues. And that's another aspect of, of the environmental uh, issue is, you know, coal continues to be uh, a major source of, of fuel in China. Um, I want to ask a question again. It's on what should we do, sort of. It's by Andre Matysek, if I say it right, from Slovakia. And he, mentions that the Biden administration is talking about organizing a summit of democracy. And as Richard said a minute ago, there's room for improvement in American democracy, I'll say, as my own editorial comment. And, um, but it says in the question, if such a summit would take place and we organized a, a summit to improve democracy, he assumes China and Russia would not be invited. And he's wondering whether or not it makes sense to organize uh, the strategic mindset vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia in that part as an ideological struggle. Um, 
is I hear a lot uh, a talk about a return to great power competition. And it seems to me that part of that is an argument that today, both China, uh, but also Russia are promoting worldwide a different perspective on the best way to organize. It is an ideological struggle when they talk about it in that way. So I'm wondering, I guess it's an open question. Is that what we're looking at into the future? Is that a productive or not productive way to think about what's emerging? I think um, there has been a shift, um, you know, especially in the US-China context. You know, what was originally primarily um, geopolitical competition has increasingly taken on ideological tones on both sides. Um, and especially, it's especially evident um, on the Chinese side where you know, originally discussions about authoritarian capitalism were very much um, internal uh, increasingly, that rhetoric is used, being used publicly and openly, and it really just came out in full force in 2020 um, as China basically gloated not just to its own public, uh, but to the whole world. You know, liberal democracies are failing, and uh, authoritarian capitalism is the way to go. Um, it's very reminiscent of the liberal triumphalism of the end of history, you know, with the end of Cold War and Francis Fukuyama, I guess 30 years ago, um, what, you hear, what you hear coming out of Beijing now uh, sounds very similar to that kind of triumphalism. So there's clearly an ideological dimension, but it's, this is not some kind of blueprint of the Cold War. It's such a different world. Again, I keep talking about interdependence, but you know, there really were two different blocks during the Cold War. No such thing is gonna to exist today. Um, however, there will be coalitions that mobilize around different issues, and it will sometimes have an ideological tenor. Finally, towards the end, I can agree, disagree at least a little bit with Peter. Okay. <laughs> to just spice it up a little bit um, here. I agree fully with you on that a lot of this is coming from Beijing, um, that the ideological dimension has been inserted through this uh, in this by Beijing. Um, I would disagree on the fact that, uh, you know, with uh, saying no such thing as two blocks separated from each other can emerge. If we look at Chinese strategy at the moment and the way it decouples itself um, from the global economy, the way self-reliance is being focused on, if you look at the dual circulation strategy, um, how the kind of the idea of building a resilient econ economy that can actually exist in autarky under conditions of heightened conflict um, is something that is very worrying in, for all those that are interested in free flows of goods and trades and services and all of that. So I think um, we have to be very careful in that regard that we are not kind of projecting because we don't want to call it a Cold War, that we're not seeing that what China is doing at the moment is actually playing exactly in that area. And that doesn't only include the economic dimension through its actions in China, in Hong Kong, um, with regard to Canadian hostage taking, Michael Corbett, Michael Spavor, it also isolates China from travel, from experts, from conversations, from people to people exchange that could otherwise be possible. So I do think that we have to be very careful there. Um, maybe there is more emerging there than we would like to see in terms of an actual kind of, yeah, taking, taking a block stance there. Well, we are I think that's fair. I think that's a fair criticism. Um, I, I definitely agree that there's plenty of evidence on both sides of um, heading towards decoupling. I guess the optimist in me wants to believe that it's not really possible and that saner heads are going to realize that we're, we're just too interdependent for that to, to truly happen. I could definitely be wrong about that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably just my glass half full. If I, if I just jump in very briefly, I think it depends on how we define ideology, um, you know, because, and, and, and then also whether we treat ideology as a source of the conflict or as a tool within the conflict. And uh, I would probably be leaning towards that China and uh, maybe others are treating ideology as a tool, that it's not really a source. So what was described, right, about Chinese heavy-handed approaches uh, in Hong Kong, all, all over the place. Uh, I, I think we, we, the frame of the, of the ideology may be one, but another is simply a power politics, right? 
Um, so yeah, I think, as I said, it depends on, on, on how we would define what we mean by ideology. But personally, I don't think it will be very useful for us to highlight uh, ideology struggle as a source of, uh, of the conflict. I am very aware that you three have given us your dinner hour and that uh, we're holding you now back from <laughs> eating and getting on with your families. So I'm, I'm going to bring this to a close. We have lots more questions. We have questions about what should be done with North Korea and China, the Belt and Road Initiative and whether European states uh, should be involved or, or stay away and so on. So, so, so I apologize to many of the questioners that we can't get to. Uh, but as I said, I, I'll give any of you three a last word if you'd like it uh, as we leave. But uh, you have my very great, uh, my, my very good appreciation for giving us this uh, dinner hour and coming to us uh, here in Columbus. Do you have anything you'd like to say to close or can we, we'll just end it here. So thank you very much. I'd like to have, uh, you get a round of applause from me and I'm imagining we still have over a hundred people on. So you've not only drawn a large audience, you kept it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, I hope to all see you in Columbus uh, at some point.